Hi. Welcome to um, the latest in our series of Ausdocs. Well, some of us call them masterclasses. Um, it's a really jam-packed night tonight. So tonight's topic is crowdfunding. And um, I don't think the pyramids were crowdfunded, but the Statue of Liberty apparently was. <laughs> and in 1885, 120,000 people, most of whom only gave a dollar, kicked off the whole idea of how we can do this. It goes back further in time, obviously. The term was first used um, for films in around 2006. But from the time the internet emerged, um, people were already aware that it was a great place to start looking for money and there were various people raising funds for things, anything from rock tours to open source software right back in the 1990s, so long ago. By 2012 there were more than 450 crowdfunding platforms out there. I went to a seminar recently on how to become a YouTube megastar and the American <laughs> lecturer said that um, crowdfunding is virtually dead in the US but I don't think we're experiencing that here. And despite saying that, in one month in 2014, more than 60,000 US dollars were raised every hour via global crowdfunding initiatives. 442 crowdfunding campaigns were launched globally every day in that month. Uh, the most money raised by crowdfunding so far is for something called Star Citizen, an online space trading and combat video game being developed by a few clever people who claim to have raised over 80,000 US dollars. Crowdfunding websites worldwide raised $89 million in US in 2010 and it's kept going up every year after that. Um, I wasn't able to find any figures for more recently, but I became very much aware of it, and possibly you did, too, in 2009 with the British film The Age of Being Stupid. I think I got emails from Franny Armstrong, the director, who also directed McLeibel and Drowned Out for about six years before and after. She spent five years raising money from June 2004 to 2009, and she raised um, one and a half million pounds for that film. And people have been um, doing it ever since. So tonight we've got this really fantastic panel um, who have all got so much experience in different ways with getting their projects off the ground. And we're going to show a little uh, video presentation from Cheryl Fajanich, um, who's an award-winning filmmaker whose documentary and fiction films have screened at hundreds of worldwide festivals and on television. And um, you can look up some of her work on uh, by Googling Sink or Swim, which she made in 2008, and her new feature film, Back on Board, Greg Laganis, which is about... Um, most of her films seem to have a wet component. <laughs> um, this one is about a fantastic... Actually, it's a very moving trailer. Um, I watched it this afternoon. It's about an Olympic diver. Um, are we going to play that? Yep, we're going to play that now and then I'll introduce the rest of the illustrious panel surrounding me. Hi Ozdocs, my name is Cheryl Ferjanik and I'm a filmmaker based in New York City. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you today and uh, sorry I can't be there in person but thanks to Rowena Potts for asking me to join the panel. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about crowdfunding and audience building for documentary. Um, in my opinion, these two things cannot be separated. They are uh, two parts of the same whole, so uh, that's why I always like to talk about them together. So these are uh, the two campaigns of my own that I ran successfully through a Kickstarter platform. One was to raise funds to produce a DVD of my first feature documentary called Sink or Swim. And the other was to raise funds for shooting of my... Uh, documentary back on board, or continued shooting of my documentary back on board about Greg Luganus. So I've also consulted on quite a few um, crowdfunding projects over the years. Uh, it's something that I sort of started to do accidentally as friends said to me, well, how did you do your Kickstarter campaign? And uh, it was something that I really enjoy talking about and enjoy uh, helping other people through. So that's when I sort of got started doing this. All of these campaigns are campaigns that I've helped on at some point during their run. It could have been before they started, it could have been after they began. 
So this is a little bit about my um, back on board campaign, which we did through Kickstarter. Um, you can explore it a little bit more um, through the link that I'll send to Rowena uh, and she can share with you. But this is the project that we launched in the summer of 2012. I will go ahead and play the pitch video for you and then I'll talk a little bit more about what went on with this campaign. Hi, I'm Cheryl Frajanic. And I'm Will Sweeney. And we're inspired by the incredible life story of world champion diver Greg Luganis. We really wanted to watch a documentary about Greg's life, but then we realized that film doesn't exist. We reached out to Greg last year and he jumped on board. He's really good at that. We started financing the film independently so we could be true to Greg's story and make it our own way. A lot of people are curious about what Greg's been up to these days and some people haven't even heard of him. This movie's gonna change that. And now, for the first time ever, right here on Kickstarter, we want to show you our trailer. Who is Greg Luganus? Who is Greg Luganus? I don't know. He has perfect form in one of the most demanding individual events in the world of sport, diving. His name is Greg Luganus. Nothing short of a gold medal is expected of the person considered the best. They really don't come any better than Greg Luganus. Good evening from Seoul. Last night, high drama on the high board. It's a picture that will be replayed slowly through sports history. A 28-year-old champion lacerated the back of his head and returned to the board. His next dive was almost flawless. Luganus wins his second gold medal of these Olympics, becoming the first man to win both the platform and the springboard competition in two Olympic Games. I knew in my heart that those were my last competitive dives. I think diving's been good for me, but it's time to get on with my life. The medals aren't going to keep you warm at night. After that, it was really important for me to be able to tell my story with dignity. My name is Craig Luganus. I'm gay and I'm HIV positive. Why are you doing it? I wanted people to understand that HIV and AIDS is not a death sentence, and you can achieve. You can even win Olympic medals. Had he been a straight athlete, he would have made millions. Why didn't you get the endorsements? Why aren't you more successful? It doesn't matter. Oh, dear God. live the consequences of decisions that you make. I've been absent from diving and out of the bright spotlight for 20 years. Now 51-year-old Greg Luganus, leading by example, is here as part of USA Diving's Athlete Mentor Program. Having him here as a role model and a mentor is invaluable. It's been great to come back to diving. I feel welcome. Congratulations. I feel welcome back. I didn't expect to be here this long. I didn't think I would see 30. But now, after all this time, I'm still here, and I feel better than ever about who I am and where I'm at. What the public saw was pretty incredible, but what was going on behind the scenes was, I think, even more incredible. As you can tell, we're pretty excited about this movie. And we can't wait to finish it. So support our Kickstarter campaign. Um, as you can see, we tried to use a, a little bit of uh, lightness uh, into the video um, as much as we could for that was appropriate for the subject we were working on. And just here's some kind of rundown of the stats about the campaign. Um, so again, we used the Kickstarter platform. The main team was made up of two people. That was uh, me and my producer. Uh, our co-producer did uh, some work on the campaign as well, and we also were fortunate that Greg himself was willing to put out some information about the campaign on his social media platforms. Our pitch video was three minutes and 30 seconds. I would recommend something in that ballpark, not, not too much longer. Um, the graphic image we used was this one of what we call Flying Greg uh, that you see on the right here. Um, that was something that we just wanted to make sure of too, that every time you saw that image you would be reminded of our campaign. Our campaign length was 30 days. Our goal amount was $50,000. Uh, we had originally thought 
uh, we would want to raise about 70 through Kickstarter, but we spoke with somebody there at the organization. They sort of recommended that that was a bit on the high end. Um, one thing we did do in our campaign was say to our backers that, in fact, this was just a small piece of what we needed to, to complete the film, but that this would help us complete the shooting of the film. So we made clear in our campaign itself that we needed about $300,000 to finish the film. Uh, we did raise about 55000 just over $55,000. The most popular reward uh, was $25, and this is the case across the board for Kickstarter uh, campaigns. Um, so $25 is actually a good place to think about putting your uh, film as the reward. Our main social media was Facebook and Twitter, which served us just fine. Uh, if you're big on Instagram, go for it. Uh, we had a 601 backers, offered 16 reward levels, including one that we put in right towards the end uh, to incentivize giving at the end. Uh, we posted uh, eight updates during the campaign on Kickstarter itself, but many more on Facebook and Twitter. And we were able to generate uh, 10 articles on mainstream news or blogs uh, throughout the campaign as well to draw extra attention uh, that we know um, got us extra backers during the campaign. So where do you start with your crowdfunding campaign? For me, this always comes down to this image, the target. Who do you think the key people will be? will be supportive of your campaign, and how can you reach them? So here's a little bit more about that. And part of this is uh, direct from Peter Broderick, uh, peterbroderick.com. If you've never looked at his work, he's fantastic and talks a lot about this kind of thing also in his work. So the first kind of audience you're going to work to identify is your personal audience. This is your loyal, regular viewers, friends, families, coworkers. If you've already got mailing lists, this is people you can communicate with, people you've met along the way in making your other films. This is that stack of business cards on your desk uh, from folks that you've met at a conference. Um, you can start gathering this information, start gathering these folks into a list. Uh, MailChimp is a good free way to create a mailing list if you don't already have one. Um, but basically the folks that you're going to reach out to directly to make a personal plea about your, about your crowdfunding campaign. The next list um, is really where you're going to do your most, the most amount of homework. Um, so this is the core audience, so an audience of people who are identifiable and reachable. These could be folks defined by identity, whether it's ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or age, or defined by their passionate interests. Tibetan monks college a cappella lovers, or folks who love synchronized swimming. And when I made that film, it was clear that there were actually quite a few folks who loved synchronized swimming and who were synchronized swimmers who were already gathering online in groups talking about their love for it. So it was my job to find out where these folks were hanging out and how to tap into those groups. So the one that we're not going to talk about is general audience. That's really the kind of audience you get when you can have mass market, uh, and that's not what we're doing here. So this is the film that, uh, again, you saw the trailer for earlier. At some point in the editing room, I was working on the project, and this was uh, even before we did the campaign. And I started making a list of all the possible target audiences I could think of uh, for this film. So the ones on the left-hand side are a little more broad, but a little more sort of obvious, a little more general, uh, bigger categories uh, of possible audiences. The uh, items on the right-hand side are a little more granular, a little more specific, and as I like to say, get weird with it. Uh, so that's where left-handed came in. Not long after that, I saw this, uh, which I found on Twitter, which was somebody asking Greg, is it true that you're left-handed? Lefty nation, lefties rock, uh, which was uh, great. So the main crowdfunding platforms that we hear, use here in the States are Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and Seed and Spark. Kickstarter is still the kind of brand name uh, of crowdfunding platforms, and um, that's the one that I have used, as I mentioned, for my projects. Um, and uh, I sometimes, in, in this presentation, will probably slip in and out of using crowdfunding and Kickstarter uh, interchangeably, but, you know extrapolate from uh, from what I say for the platform that you're working on. So just to kind of give you a sense, um, these are the top funded documentaries on Kickstarter. The highest funded project is $384,000. 
and the eighth highest is $247,000. So this is just to kind of give you an example of some big hits on uh, Kickstarter and documentary. Um, I imagine that your projects will will kind of uh, run the gamut in, in uh, how much you're looking to raise. Um, but I wanted to kind of just give a sense of, you know, for example, like we, we did need to raise about $300,000 to make our film, but we didn't think we could do that on Kickstarter. So we, we chose a much lower amount. So here's some tips on creating your own crowdfunding campaign, tips that I've learned from doing my own campaigns and advising some other people. So one is just remember that this all takes a lot of work. You know, there's, this is not the kind of thing where you push go and just watch people donate. It is hard work every day and it, you're cultivating this this audience uh, on a daily basis. Cr crowdfunding is a team sport, um, so this work is a lot easier if you have team members to do it with, and every contact on your personal list could be doubled uh, or at least increased by the contacts on your team members' personal list. Um, so this is something that I would recommend doing, is figuring out you know who's on your team and how you can work together to do this work. Start building your audience first. This is something you can do today, even before you think about launching your campaign. Just figure out where these potential audiences are and where you can find them. Uh, use social media strategically. So uh, think about your presence on Facebook, Twitter, and how you might uh, bulk it up uh, in anticipation of your campaign. Uh, also, you don't want to be only posting uh, fund my movie, fund my movie, fund my movie for 30 days straight. You, your friends will not like you anymore. Um, so just also think about other ways to engage folks on social media. Study other pages for inspiration and ideas of what to do and what not to do, especially what not to do if you find uh, videos that are too long, um, campaigns that are too wordy. Um, I think you'll be able to kind of quickly suss out what works and what doesn't work as an audience member. Become part of the crowdfunding community. If you have not yet joined uh, the platform you like to work on, I recommend doing so and in fact funding other people's work while you're on there. I think that's a great way to uh, show that you're a part of this ecosystem. Uh, figure out who should collect the funds. Should it be you, your producer, your fiscal sponsor? Um, in my opinion, a pitch video is non-negotiable. It's not enough to just show the trailer for your film. Um, it is, you know, again, the next one is make it personal. So it is about you and the film that you're making and how can you convince us, um, that this is a good idea. Give a lot of thought to your goal amount. Um, so again, we had thought, uh, we in fact had wanted to raise quite a bit more than we did. Um, but we knew we couldn't do it on Kickstarter. So we chose a lower amount and, uh, consider having someone in the wings waiting to help just in case you get very, very close, but are a few thousand dollars short, is there someone who can pitch in and you can then turn around and give that money back to? It's gaming the system just a little bit, but it might be worth it if you're going to get $45,000 out of it. Um, if possible, use larger events or holidays as tie-ins. We were able to, uh, we, we ended up shooting during the Olympics in 2012 in London with Greg, and so that was a great way for us to get some extra traction that we might not have gotten otherwise because people were excited to uh, know about the Olympics, write about the Olympics, blog about the Olympics. I'd recommend a 30-day campaign. Uh, 60 days is just too long for anyone to keep up two months of momentum, the kind of stamina it takes to do this work. Um, 30 days also kind of incentivizes giving in a different way with a, a deadline that's coming up rather quickly. Um, folks are more likely to give as the deadline approaches. Keep your backers updated throughout the campaign uh, and afterwards. Um, definitely let them know how things are going as things progress. Target press uh, and bloggers about the campaign. It's sort of harder than it uh, I think used to be to get folks to write about Kickstarter and crowdfunding campaigns, but um, it could be worth it if you get if you get a good write-up, you might want to offer somebody uh, to do a guest blog post for them or offer them a, a scene that doesn't appear anywhere else, um, uh, photos that no one else has access to, something that incentivizes them to uh, write about your campaign. And then also wrapping up the campaign. Um, how are you going to bring it home? Can you do a stretch goal if you reach your goal early? Um, and also just in Kickstarter at least, um, 
once the campaign is finished, the text is locked forever. So if you have another way for people to give after the campaign, you might want to put that link at the very top uh, of your campaign uh, text uh, so that when the campaign is in fact finished, people who stumble upon this uh, crowdfunding site later can uh, still know how they can support you. So your social media presence is something to give some thought to. Um, you know, you are by no means obligated to use all of these platforms, but really think through which are the best for you and the folks that you're trying to find funds from. So here we are, the last slide, your Kickstarter to-do list. Um, it may seem a little overwhelming, but I think this, if you can kind of think through this list um, and start this now, no matter when you're gonna start your project, that this will get you off to a really great start. I hope you enjoy the presentation and um, good luck on all of your crowdfunding campaigns. Thanks. Have a good day. Okay. Let's just introduce everybody. Um, I'm going to have Phoebe in a minute. Anna Carter. Kata. Kata. Um, who began her career as a print journalist and has worked for the ABC, Four Corners, TV programs such as that. She began her documentary production company, Mitra Films, more than 15 years ago. Uh, you might know her well for films such as Dick Smith's Population Puzzle, which she made for the ABC, and Frank Hurley, The Man Who Made History. Um, she's currently producing the feature film Rites of Passage with a very interesting community arts organisation called Beyond Empathy. Pat Fisk, the wonderful Pat Fisk, well known probably to everybody here, a very active member of the documentary film community and of Ozdocs. Um, Pat, wow, what hasn't Pat done? She was actually um, awarded in 2001 with the prestigious Stanley Hawes Award for her outstanding contribution to the documentary industry and for very good reason. Um, her filmmaking career as a director and producer and also as a sound recordist goes back to the 1970s. Um, and the film that she's working on at the moment is When the Camera Stopped Rolling, which has had um, an interesting career already. It's about um, Lilius Castle, who was a... Lilius Fraser. Fr Fraser, yeah, that's right. That was her... Husband, it's, it's directed by Jane Castle, who's one of her daughters, and Pat will tell us all about that and how the funding has been arranged with that. Nicole O'Donoghue has uh, wrenched her way um, out of the final days before the premiere of her feature film, directed by Simon Stone. It's his debut. It will be premiering next week at the Sydney Film Festival, and that is The Daughter, also produced with Jan Chapman. And you may remember she made quite a splash with The Last Empresario, which was Gracie Otto's debut feature documentary. Um, Sarah Linton and Erin Peterson are joining us tonight. Um, they've pulled their heads out of the edit of Zach Cere Zach's Ceremony, which I saw the trailer presented at Good Pitch last year. And this um, film came about in an interesting way as well. Sarah is a freelance producer who started her career in the UK. She's been in Australia since 2002. And most recently she post-produced a 13-part series called On the Edge for, the, for ABC3 and NITV. And that is where you actually came into contact with the characters in Zach's Ceremony. And she's working, of course, with Erin Peterson, who is the director of the project and who is the founder and director of a post-production facility called Postbox Studios. And you can Google that. Dr Phoebe Hart is joining us on Skype. She is also a really interesting and um, tenacious filmmaker, like everybody on the panel. She has directed and produced documentaries, factual content and children's television and completed a PhD in 2009. She's probably best known for her documentary film Orchids, My Intersex Adventure. <laughs> um, and you can Google the trailer for that as well. And that film premiered at the Brisbane International Film Festival. So just while we're getting that going, um, I found this quote about Phoebe, one of, about Phoebe's <laughs> film, Orchids, My Intersex Adventure. 
And uh, this is what someone said. If there were an Academy Award category called Best Achievement in No Budget, One Hour Documentary, <laughs> Straight from the Depth of One's Soul, Filmmaking, Phoebe Hart's Orchids, My Intersex Adventure would bag the little gold statue with the ambiguous genitalia. Absolutely no question. <laughs> um, maybe you can just let us know what you're working on at the moment. Oh. Um, yes, well, uh, we've just, I've been working on a couple of different projects. Uh, one of them is called Thomas Banks' Quest for Love, which is a story of a, a young gay playwright with cerebral palsy and his journey to find love in all the wrong places and all the right places, I suppose, too. And um, I'm also working on another feature documentary called Handbag, which is the story of a third-generation fag hag. Uh, and I've just started w working on a new project on a, a, a horror film director who lives in Nambour in Queensland. Okay, so if crowdfunding is all about finding your community, um, maybe you can fill us in about what the different word, communities that you're working with for these three films how you've connected with them and how invested they are in the in the outcome. Um, so I've been working on a project with um, a, a, a small team uh, called Thomas Banks' Quest for Love and we've just finished um, a possible campaign to finish the post-production on that, which was successful. Um, and so therefore we were going... We were raising about $10,000, that was our target, just to help out with a bit of the post-production on that. And um, uh, we had the match funding um, campaign also that ran recently. So Creative Partnerships Australia did a dollar for dollar matching if you managed to raise your target um, amount, which we did and we exceeded. So that's really great. And um, uh, I, yeah, it doesn't seem like much $10,000. I mean, it's nice now, it's $20,000, I suppose, but um, uh, it is very hard work even getting like just that little bit of money together um, through crowdfunding, I would say, because, uh, yeah, we, we just had to really pound the pavement in order to sort of like get um, build interest, uh, find an audience, um, bother our friends and family members to help out in any way that they could. And it really was something that we worked on pretty much every day um, for a few weeks leading up to it and then during the, the entire campaign. So... Very grateful to have made the, the target on that one. Filmmaking is a pretty gruelling experience without having to crowdfund your financing. Would you recommend it? Um, well, kind of, yeah, I do. Because um, I suppose, like, you know, I, I guess I've made films which have gone down the path of um, uh, obtaining funding, I guess, through, um, through pre-sale uh, with one of the major broadcasters and then getting kind of funding, public funding together via the um, screen agencies and um, while that is a, a, I mean, if you can get that pre-sale, I mean, you're, you're sort of laughing, I suppose, to some degree. I mean, it's not an entirely sort of straightforward process either, but I guess what is the main impediment there is that you're probably beholden to all those different organisations to um, have a product that is, um, you know, a, a suitable to them. And I guess here we feel like we're accountable to our audience directly kind of thing, like we're not sort of acquitting to, um, you know, buy the book with, um, I guess, a screen agency, but we're actually sort of, you know, we're responsible to the people who believe in us, basically. So we, uh, you know, we now are entitled to finish this film and get it out there and show it to the, pe the people who believe in us. And it's sort of, in some ways, it's kind of, it has a nice feel to it. I don't know. I like the fact that, that we, you know, we found an audience. We've got, like, people who are really interested in our topic and that they want to support it and and um, we don't want to let them down now basically we want to get this film made to the best of our ability and I suppose we're now like it feels to me like um, like the avenues for getting films on telly uh, are, are quite difficult um, it seems that you know like even for a small time you know or small smaller or emerging producers to sort of go directly to the ABC or SBS seems a little bit more, a, a lot more difficult nowadays. And um, you'd have to normally go through even another entity, like a big production company, I suppose. So so it sort of helps, like, um, I guess, emerging or grassroots or guerrilla-style filmmaking um, uh, a lot better than, say, other, you know, more traditional format um, funding routes. That's my opinion, at least. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Is, can you tell us a little bit about other projects that you've used and how different they were in terms of working with the community or well, the way you structured it? Well, we've also done a possible campaign for the other film, um, Handbag, which is um, the third generation fag hag story. So, um, and that was, um, again, for just a part of the production process, we wanted to send out our, our protagonist, who is also the director of the film, Monica Davidson, to the US to go to Pride in San Francisco and to get interviews with um, scholars, celebrities, um, just and just people generally from the community over there to sort of like broaden the reach of that film so that it had a bit more of an international flavour. And so therefore we reached out again to our community and, um, and worked with them to sort of raise that money in order to send her over there. Um, so it sort of has worked quite well in the sense of like, you know, we've had very specific targets in, in each of those cases where, uh, um, you know, by hook or by crook, we've tried lots of other avenues, but this is sort of presented itself. And in a sense, it's sort of, like, I'll just come back to, to, it feels honest. It feels like, you know, it feels like um, the kind of work that you might do, I don't know, it just, it, it, you really do have to sort of like equip to your audience directly kind of thing. And if your audience doesn't believe in the project or in the, uh, the what you're making the film about, then they won't, they won't support it by taking out their credit card and making a pledge. So it, it's, it feels to me like it's a really direct method of actually engaging an audience and also funding your film at the same time. Um, the only problem is, I suppose, is that you can't, you know, Films are incredibly expensive, so you know to you, you know you have to sort of run campaign after campaign if you're thinking of you know, making your entire film in that in that um, respect. They're really fun-sounding ideas, and you just you referred a little bit earlier to the freedom that you found making films in this way gives you. Would you have come up with these concepts? You think if this type of funding wasn't available to you? film uh, pre-sold to a big broadcaster or distributor interested in what you've got, then probably you're not, I don't know, like, you know, maybe there would you know, there would be some arguments to say, well, you're not market worthy or something like that, you know, like, but I have, I have a feeling that there's a lot more ideas out there than what can be um, successfully broadcast or what, you know, the broadcaster has a remit to actually show. So... Um, a lot of the, like, subject matters do actually fall through the cracks. And so documentaries that are on uh, non-mainstream topics, you know, like, which do have an audience out there um, uh, and usually a very strong and loyal audience, you know, for those kinds of films, this is an ideal kind of method to get out there and get the film made to a, a higher quality than, say, for example, if you just did it with, you know, a few twigs, a bit of spit and, you know, like some prayers or whatever kind of thing, trying to stick it all together. Um, this sort of, you know, this sort of helps, like, to, you know, make quality work that will, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I guess then help people change their minds or, you know, like, help people within a community feel validated or, you know, like, change things in some way or another, which I think is always the, a lot, you know, oftentimes is the objective of many documentary filmmakers. And also, you know, with the age of being stupid, they actually pioneered their own distribution system, indie screenings, which allowed anyone anywhere to hold a screening of the film and keep the profits for themselves, which was they had an environmental message they wanted to go get out there. But how is this going to impact on your distribution now that you've built this audience who are supporting the funding of the film? Or are you not there yet? Well, I guess, yet? Um, I guess uh, it, as far as distribution goes, I mean... Uh, you know, I guess the, the crowdfunding campaigns that we've run. I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they. If we couldn't have reached this audience through social media or like you know social networking or whatever. In any case, but I guess now you know like if you think about it in terms of like so you know like this you know social networks how they actually sort of reach audiences and how there are influencers and there are people who are passionate that will like blog about this like you know every chance that they get. And influence other people to you know come to the project. I mean, you're more likely, I guess, as a kind of um, someone in the social media, net, you know, biosphere or whatever out there, sort of like you know putting things on your Facebook page. You're probably more likely to 
really get out there and sort of say, hey, um, you really have to take notice of this if you've actually financially supported it as well. Like, in a sense, you're sort of creating people who have more of a buy-in to the project, and so therefore you've got like a maybe like then a stable of, you know, a couple of hundred really rabid supporters who will then by hook or by crook when the film comes out um, tell all their networks and, you know, get their networks to tell their networks. And so I suppose in, in that kind of way it does, you know, create a distribution model that is not the typical one, but it's probably one that sort of, I guess, even like very mainstream projects are trying to harness. But I don't know how successfully they would unless they've got like, unless projects, you know, like documentaries have like a Stephen Fry character who's got a Twitter following of like, you know, a couple of million or something that it can just tweet out about this. You know, like it's very hard, I guess, for even mainstream funded uh, through the, you know, traditional systems, like to, to get that kind of loyal following behind them that will actually promote the film. There is this organisation called Creative Partnerships Australia and um, they have, I mean, like the research is from, you know, like crowdfunding organisations or, you know, like kind of uh, organisations that sort of facilitate philanthropy for artistic projects. You know, the, the, the research shows that, you know, people can raise funds through crowdfunding but sometimes those projects don't get completed and dollar for dollar matching by these kinds of organisations that are run as kind of quasi or, you know, government supported organisations, it's been shown to really get projects across the line because I guess, I guess if you're like, you know, if, if, if you, people ask for $10,000, but they actually need more than that, generally speaking. So, so uh, they've created this um, program called Match and Match is that you, you know, for every dollar that you raise, uh, they will give you uh, a dollar matching. Uh, up until the, the, you know, a target, you know, you have to reach the target. We have a target of $10,000. So once we hit that target, it's like, yes, it's assured that that's going to be doubled. And that's an amazing bonus for us because uh, I guess to go out and get $20,000, it's so much more work and so much more risky in that time frame that, you know, like you've got a possible campaign that's going to run for 60 days or something like that. If you don't make it, you don't get any of your pledges. So it's very risky to sort of ask for too much money. So... This really ensures that you know you, we're getting a health, much healthier budget as a result um, to work with on our post-production for Thomas Banks. And um, I guess another sort of avenue, probably worth looking at, if you're on the the Creative Partnerships um, uh, Australia website, is that they have uh, uh, another arm called um, uh, AFC Australian. Uh, 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 funding, something, something like cultural funding. I can't even remember now. I'm having a mind blank. But basically, it's their own portal, which will give a completely tax deductible um, uh, uh, discount or whatever to any funder. And that's probably something that's really good for if you think that you can get maybe four or five individuals to put in like two or three or four thousand dollars each, kind of thing. You know, like a big amount. And these are people who. who are maybe high worth individuals and you know they need a tax break of some sort or another and they believe in your project that's quite a nice um alternate kind of thing to just someone you know like grandma putting in two dollars you know of her kind of pension money and you know sort of cobbling it together that way so um if you go to australia um, as, um creative partnerships australia and then there's the australian cultural funding website i think it's called which is attached to that and if you get a project approved with that then that's another option um, other than, say, Possible or Indiegogo or one of these other types of crowdfunding situations. Thank you, Phoebe. Let's give her a round of applause. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Um, Anna, perhaps you'd like to pick up there because um, Beyond yeah. Empathy is a very interesting organisation and in its charter it says it uses the arts to influence change and enrich the lives of individuals and communities experiencing recurring hardship and it began its community arts and cultural development work in remote New South Wales and today it works in urban, suburban, regional and remote communities across Australia where multiple disadvantage is to be found. And it's had some great success, including Anna's film Rites of Passage, which won the Special Jury Prize at the Warsaw Film Festival in 2013. So perhaps you could um, sure. give us the background. Um, hi, everybody. So when we did our crowdfunding campaign for Rites of Passage, which is, you'll actually get to see, it's on um, ABC One on June the 28th at 10.30. And it's a 
sort of hybrid documentary feature film with disadvantaged young people creating the scripts and writing it. So when we did it, by the time we wanted to crowdfund, we'd actually got made the film and were into just about to start post-production funding. So we were really clear that we were only asking for funding for that. Um, the budget for the film is about 500000 but in these sorts of films with community arts groups, a lot of that is just helping the young people. It's not actually going into the film. Um, uh, we found it hard because our film was disadvantaged young people, so it's hard to find that niche group that people have already started talking about to target, you know, a skating group or a... That really helps when you can do that. I think our sort of niches were community organisations and people in that sector and philanthropists. So that's a pretty hard sort of niche group to go after, but we already had those on side because it's a community arts organisation that was had all that sort of loyal following. I mean, my practical advice, we went out for our campaign at the end of the year and I wouldn't do that. I think it's really gets crowded at the end of the year. I would go for something in the about now or the beginning of the year, or as Phoebe said before, June 30, because that's when you've got your corporates trying to get some tax deductions for all their money. I think that's a good idea. I'd do that too. Um, I wouldn't do it at the end of the year. I think it, I just felt like there was too many people doing it, other campaigns. Um, I think the, as other people have said today already that the marketing is just as important as the fundraising. So for us, you know, suddenly we got 300 loyal supporters who then followed us to the post-production and then the touring and the screening and everything. And then we'll use and build on that for the next film. So that, I think, is just as important as raising money in this process. Um, uh, we went with Possible, Possible's Australian. Um, it's all or nothing, as you guys said, so if you don't get your target, you don't get anything. That when you put in $100, say, as a donation, that doesn't get um, tripped until that you reach your target, so it doesn't get taken out of your credit card or whatever, the donors. Um, we actually raised, we, so we were going to raise 50 grand and then we got cold feet and thought, let's go for 25, because it was a bit of an experiment when we did it. We got that in 10 days. <laughs> so then it was hard to keep asking for money. And so then we, we updated our possible site twice. And the second time we asked, we said, OK, now can we, we've got the target, but we still need more money. We want it for touring and for an Adam guide, I think. So we sort of kept, and we got in the end, to, but it was really hard, I think, to keep asking people for money when you've made a target. So we got up to 33 in the end, but we also had some big donations that came through through that campaign, but not through Possible, which probably brought us up to about 50 grand in the end. Um, I was lucky because Community Arts, the group that I was working with, Beyond Empathy, they've got 100% tax deductibility. So we directed everybody, they could get it through us. They didn't need it through DAF or any other organisation that people are using that Phoebe mentioned. We decided about a week or two before we started our campaign to totally ditch our rewards. Uh, we gave people downloads and we gave them DVDs and invites to premiere screenings and things like that. But we decided we wouldn't put out and make hats, T-shirts, posters, whatever. We just thought, because we were a community arts organisation, we just didn't think people really needed all that junk. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people, you know, from $100 onwards, you got tax deductibility and you can't get a reward and get tax deductibility. You can only do one or the other legally. So that sort of helps you a bit in a way. Um, I think it took probably half, it cost half the money to raise it, <laughs> the, the target. If we bought, you know, if you calculate my time, the directors, the social media people making the trailer and all of that, I reckon it cost 15 grand to make 30 grand. So it's, you know, you're not, as people have already started talking about, it's more about an audience building and a marketing thing and you're not going to make a lot of money. Um, Gaby Baby was doing it at the same time as us and they had a target of 100 grand and they were doing it over three months. Ours was uh, 25 grand over one month. And over three months, it's really hard to sustain such a long um, campaign. And what the key that they found and people who are doing crowdfunding find that towards, in the middle and towards, once you've gone to all your friends and all those sorts of people, 
uh, and loyal supporters, then you really need to get some like key media or something to keep your campaign going. So Gaby Baby got in the middle of their campaign, Graham Blundell wrote a one-page article about it in the Sun Herald, about their crowdfunding campaign. And so suddenly then that got all that new momentum and more sort of general public to donate. And that was a key for them. They couldn't have got there otherwise with that sort of media to keep tripping it along. Um, hmm, I think that's probably... I mean, it's hard... I mean, we only had, you can't believe it, on the Beyond Empathy uh, web, uh, email list. They had 900 people and I had 800 on my own personal one. So it's not a lot of people you're reaching out to start with. I mean, when we were being coached for our crowdfunding campaign, they were saying you should start with, you know, it's a bit like pyramid selling, you start with 90,000 people, you ask them and then you ask, they keep going. But each time you go, you ask people to forward your email, the, weeks get, the links get weaker and you're not going to get as much money from those steps that you continue with. I mean, I think I found it, apart from the marketing, the audience building, I think it was a really good excuse to go out and ask people for money. I had a, I've got a lot of people on my email list and I probably wouldn't personally approach them, but, you know, like Rebel Penfold, Russell's my neighbour and she's on my list and gave five grand, bang. But I wouldn't have gone next door and said, Rebel, give you money. <laughs> but she was on the email list and um, Dick Smith was another one who was on my list and this other woman from Aboriginal Benefits Foundation because um, we've got a lot of Indigenous people in our f uh, film. So they gave like 15, 20 grand between them. But I wouldn't have gone to them personally for various reasons, but I felt comfortable because it was a crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. And then the most key thing we found in the whole thing was the trailer. Not the trailer for the film, the trailer for the crowdfunding campaign. We were lucky because we had disadvantaged children, so I call it the World Vision trailer. <laughs> you can pull a lot of heartstrings. And we actually made two trailers. The first one we made, or the pictures, it had the director Philip and asking, and we just found that was boring and flat and not interesting. Chuck that out, we got all the kids saying hey, they're from the ghettos and give us money and stuff and <laughs> it's, you have a look, you'd have a look. Are we going to look at that now? And it, it, you know, it's very emotional and it works. It, I think we worked out every time anyone hit on our trailer, we got an average $10. So it's the first, your first port of call. <laughs> so I suppose when you, just to finish, when you watch that trailer, and what's really, really important when you're making a trailer is to answer the why question. You know, why are you making this film? Why are people, are you asking for money? Why should people fund the film? It's not really about the film per se or anything. That's what you've really got to direct it at, the trailer. Let's uh, move on to Pat, actually. You're right next to me. Yeah. So why, it why seems not? a good moment because you have done everything from lawn bowls and tennis to variety nights. That's not quite right, is it? <laughs> but you have done some, um, some interesting get-togethers for your community yeah. and um, it's probably been a lot of hard work. Yeah. So tell us why you had to embark on, on this strategy in the first place. Um, Jane and I applied for, for the Screen Australia Signature Funding and Signature Funding does no longer exist but I think it's called the Producer Program now and that's when you don't have to have broadcast interest um, or attachment and uh, they offer, the Screen Australia offered us a, a substantial uh, amount of the budget um, um, offered us uh, under the proviso that we would be able to raise um, a, or come up with a hundred thousand dollar shortfall of the budget that we put in. So um, we sat down. <laughs> okay, hundred thousand uh, dollars. Well, uh, one other film that I made, Scarlet Scarlet Road. We, you know, I had I had to raise like another seven thousand dollars. I mean, that was nothing. That's a hundred thousand. That's that's a big ask. So Jane and I um, talked. Other people had been, you know, that. Um, funded their films and um, so we, we um, had a plan so and we were contemplating using DAF Documentary Australia Foundation and Possible and we thought we'd launch them at the same time and then we did this straw poll and asked people um, it, how you know if we asked you um, you know potential donors what would you prefer you know would you um, would you donate 
because of the film, because of us, because uh, of a tax deduction, and 99 out of 100 say, tax deduction, please. Mm. So, I mean, that, so we ended up just going with that. And we also, um, you know, through other people got ideas and... Um, uh, we thought, okay, we want to launch DAF, you know, launch DAF campaign, and so we decided that we would have a trivia night. And um, there were two people, um, Louise and Jay, who had made All About E. I don't know if you've seen that, but they had had a trivia night, so they came on board, and a lot of Jane's friends, a few of mine, um, as ambassadors and helpers. Um, and we planned this um, amazing trivia night. Um, um, at the Paddington um, RSL Club. And there were 300 people that came, over 300 people came. And that was a great way to start the email list that we've got. <laughs> um, anyway, but we had, um, we had the, uh, an, a live auction, a silent auction. Um, we had um, raffle tickets, a few games, a band. And we had well-known presenters and, and <clears throat> this fantastic trivia queen and, um, and this lively auctioneer. She was amazing. Anyway, because she, would, she just got the prices up like you wouldn't believe, but some of them came off the back wall. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we, you know, it was a really good place to actually launch the campaign. We showed the trailer. And uh, Mitzi Goldman came from DAF and launched it for us. And um, that, was, that was really good. It was really quite successful. We were able to, I mean, it was a lot of work, like everyone says, it's a lot of work, you know. And, but we, um, we made, that night we made $28,000 clear. And then we also, um, we had personalized DAF forms to, to hand out, you know, as people left. So after that, we got a bit more money from, from through DAF as well. And people actually filled them in and handed them to us. That was, that was great as well. Um, but then, okay, so we've launched DAF. And the next one was, all right, we have to go to all our networks, all our friends, just like everyone says. And, um, and you know, like get the email out there, call people. Often it's better to call people because email, mm. you got a million emails, you know, so it's better, it's, it's quite good to send the emails, follow it up with a call, um, and have friends help you, like Martha and Sarah actually uh, agreed to contact all of the film industry because a lot of the people um, in the film industry, the older people anyway, like me, I knew Lilius quite well. Um, uh, you know, knew her, so they would want to give her her due, and they would support the film, and a lot of them have. So that's been that's been great. Um, and then the other thing we do is we asked all our ambassadors and friends if they would have a morning or afternoon tea, invite their friends or people with money <laughs> um, to come, and Jane and I would come and show the trailer, talk about the film, and it's quite interesting because these people know nothing about film, so it was, it was often re lots of fun and really interesting to meet people from all different, about, about four or five people t took us up on that, and we raised maybe 6,000 that way. Uh, through DAF, you know, we had the DAF forms, or they, you know, filled out the forms. And um, then, just last weekend, Jane and the and the amb I was overseas, but so Jane and the amb amb all our ambassadors um, organized a, a dance party, uh, which also had an auction and games, uh, and with the amazing auctioneer, <laughs> and we raised uh, twelve thousand clear. So all together we raised eighty six thousand. So um, we were just we're just short of fourteen thousand uh, by fourteen thousand to make up the hundred thousand target, and it took us seven months to do that. So you know it's a long time, but we you know feel pretty good about that, and we'll continue because we had our budget was three hundred seventy thousand. We put it up to five hundred thousand, so now we have another hundred forty four thousand to raise. Um, but uh, you know, for the, in the future, we'll, 
we'll continue, we'll, you know, follow up all those emails, uh, who, people that we didn't get a response, especially toward the, the end of the financial year, which is a good time. Mm. Um, and we'll go to corporations, philanthropic organizations, to, to raise the remainder of the film. And it's, you know, it'll take that much to make the film that we want to make. So, um, yeah. And the other things, like in the future too, there's, I don't know, do people know what TUG is, T-U-G-G? -G? Is that just gone down under? Oh, what? Someone told me today, yeah. They went, but I don't know. Yeah, well, you continue, I'm not sure. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's going gangbusters in the States. It's mm. when you, uh, anyone can, um, you, you put your film on, a, on the TUG list and uh, people, anyone can organize a screening and, and, and it's all done on the net, and as as long as it reaches the target, pay the the cinema, the filmmaker, the you know uh, the those costs, then it'll go ahead, and you can have fundraiser, you, you know, like it's. Uh, yeah. it, uh, Frank it, Burns used it target in Australia. It's a fantastic for idea, and I hope that it I hope that it just comes. And so up. the tug, they set like you know this cinema here. It's got two hundred people, so until they get enough bookings on their online thing. That doesn't. It does, they have to wait till they get up to a certain limit, and it'll trigger a screening. Yeah, and uh, is it, but it's a great way to use this amazing network that you've accumulated too, to yeah. you know, and and to get the word out about the screening, so you can make a bit more, you know, more money doing that as well in the end. So, and and the other thing about DAF is that there is no, um, tar you don't have to reach a target. You can set your own target but you don't have to reach it to get the money that you get back. You can get all the money that people put in. So I think that's the, that's, uh, you know, and they can put it $10, they can put 25, they can put any amount. So like for us, it's been great. Do you have to cross a threshold of death to get a tax deductibility? No. Any, can you no. get $10? $10. It used to be $2.50. $2. $2. Yeah, it yeah. used to be 250 but now it's, they, 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 Changed it so they could compete with the crowdfunding, you know, with the plausible mm. and um, Kickstarter and everything else. Mm. Yeah. So. So it's going really well, um, yeah. but it we'll sounds it. to me like it must have been incredibly daunting, and there would be many producers who would be extremely nervous about taking on a project like this. What I know you've got roots going down into the ground very deeply, but do you think it's all that experience that's given you the confidence to go, or do you, did you just oh, really no, feel I just, so? You know, if I like something, I'll just jump in head, you know, I don't <laughs> care. You know, I mean, I'll just try, you know, I think it's great. I want to see Lilius get her due too, you know, like she was an amazing woman. She, she, you know, had domestic violence. She became an alcoholic and raised two kids and made over 40 films. You know, it's pretty amazing to um, to make a film about her. She was very special, special. Um, I've forgotten, but I know cause since our campaign was a few years ago. But I think Kickstarter, you don't need to reach your target. All the camp, all these different people have different sort of parameters. Mm. Possible, you have to set a target and reach it. I don't think you have to with Kickstarter Indiegogo, sure. or Indiegogo, Indiegogo yet. Yeah. Maybe Kickstarter, you do. Yeah, yeah. But Indiegogo, Indiegogo, you don't have you to. Don't mm. have to I think Possible is the only He's Australian one. Which I uh, used recently, not for a film project. And it's the same thing, just whatever money you get, you get the money. Yeah, we, we used MailChimp for the last Impresario campaign, which was with Indigo, but Indiegogo. But it was our separate, we just had our email list that we then used MailChimp to send out all the emails. So it's sort of with the link. So it, you don't sort of have to hand over your email addresses to sort of, you know, the, the site that you're using. The, yeah, the, you the control it, campaigning yeah. site that you're using. You, you, they stay private with MailChimp. Mm -hmm. And they all link in, all of these possible and with their social media and that's how they're all designed. So it and, does work. And so what, what systems have you both used? Uh, MailChimp, MailChimp too. And we've MailChimp. just done another mail out this week because Pat just got one um, to say we've got the broadcast on um, at the end of June and all our loyal 200 or so donors who gave to the campaign can they help start you know, getting the word out so we use MailChimp because we had it all there we did promise everyone that we wouldn't send them too many emails mm. <laughs> okay thanks very much so I think this is a good moment to bring you in from the cold Nicole <laughs> down there and perhaps you can tell us a little bit of your story um, yeah well
well maybe we'll show you want to show your clip first well, yeah because it's we actually yeah i didn't bring the actual crowdfunding clip um but this is the trailer for the film which sort of ended up being quite similar because um it had a lot of good moments in it that yeah really we really used this as a foundation for the theatrical trailer when we ended up releasing the movie so um yeah i mean i like I, i'm the producer on the project gracie otto um wrote directed and co-produced the well wrote i mean yeah directed and co-produced the film um and she really came just to give you bit of background, she came to me um, having sort of already met Michael White, um, she had sort of already been shooting some interviews, it had been about a year and a half. Um, when she met Michael, you know, he was, obviously she sort of instantly wanted to make a film about him and he came with um, like a huge amount of um, archive that he was sort of handing to us to use, which was you know, his own family, home movies and um, photographs. And so Gracie came to me with this project and she had sort of already invested so much of her own time and money in it anyway. Um, but I could see that we had an incredible sort of, um, uh, incredible amount of resources to use. Uh, and she just had so much energy. It was really the first, she'd, she, you know, she'd made sort of a couple of short films, but... Um, I could really see that she had a lot of passion to to push it forward, um, and and she shot pretty much everything on just a Canon 5D. So we were lucky in that way because we had access to Michael, um, and she was able to sort of just travel with her camera and shoot as she sort of travelled um, herself around the world. So um, I kind of instantly got Karen Johnson, who um, is a really wonderful editor, involved, and we were sort of looking at what we had, and Karen was sort of working through, um, you know, a rough cut. We had no money though. And um, so after about six months, I was sort of like, okay, maybe maybe we'll give this crowdfunding thing a go. Um, and, you know, we undenied about it, but I, we felt like we sort of had something that we could really pitch to quite a specific audience. Um, and so we, yeah, we decided to go with Indiegogo um, purely because they, you sort of, you're not going, you don't have to reach your target with Indiegogo. Um, they do, I was just looking at the figures this afternoon, they kind of, if you hit your target, they'll take 5% and if you don't hit it, I think they take 9%. Um, so there was just a, a bit of a higher kind of, um, you know, percentage going to them. So we, yeah, we, we aimed really high. We, we kind of, we went for 100,000. Um, we, we raised... With Indiegogo, we, we raised, I think, 47000 and about 7000 of that went to credit card fees or to Indiegogo because we didn't hit the target. So we kind of got 40000 in the bank from the campaign um, and the campaign ran, ran for a month. Um, sort of thinking about sort of the pitfalls, like, we, we found it really, really hard. Like, we, we were sort of kind of sideswiped by how much, <laughs> you know, kind of you just had to be with it. 24 mm. seven um, and as soon as it as soon as the kind of train has left the station you kind of you're counting down and 30 days we're like that's ages a month but it was just you know it goes so quickly so I think midway through the campaign we ended up kind of hiring someone who was a social media um, nerd and he really worked for us um, across the rest of the campaign and also while, just after we launched the campaign, we because we were sort of still in production, shooting interviews as they came up, um, and a week after we'd launched the campaign, which was in November and December, which I think is a bad idea too, oh, yeah. um, we got a call about Kate Moss and John Cleese being able to do their interviews in, in London and, and Monaco. <laughs> and we'll, so Gracie had to sort of go on the road, and I was in Canberra working on another film, and production managing a feature film and it was sort of yeah that was we would we would lock ourselves down if we ever did it again mm. to I think that's kind of probably my biggest um, <laughs> piece of advice on it um, but the other thing that we found really amazing with it was that um, the campaign closed and we you know we'd sort of hit that $47,000 mark which is great um, but we then started getting calls from people that had only just heard about it or there was kind of like this knock-on effect that sort of went for about three months and we ended up getting really quite big ticket donations from people in the theatre community in London, like Cameron McIntosh sort of called 
well, someone from his office called saying, oh, he wants to, you know, do donate 25000 How does he do that? We tried to do it online <laughs> and the campaign's closed. So that was sort of, um, yeah, that was incredible that because you had that kind of online presence with, like, they don't pull your trailer down s as soon as the yeah. campaign finishes. And um, so I guess overall we, we really raised about 90000 from from the campaign, from the vis visibility of the campaign. Um, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We we did do the rewards thing. We sort of, we had quite a, a lot of rewards um, and we had someone come out of the woodwork who works in sort of the touring, like he kind of hosts, um, you know, like people that come to Dubai and want to put on events or, or like an Elton John concert and he will kind of facilitate that. This guy came out of the woodwork in Dubai and he really wanted to, donate because he wanted to he'd known Michael in London or had admired Michael from his school days in London or something and his reward was I think for 10,000 and it was for him to have the right to screen the movie in his home territory to a select group and that was that was all he was interested in so it was kind of good for us that we we had something that kind of um, specific on the rewards list like even if one person came out of the woodwork for that it it really um, served as well. So, yeah, it's terrifying though. I mean, I think Gracie and I both came out of it sort of going, oh, we would never do that again. Um, <laughs> because initially you feel like you are asking your, your family and friends, and but then, then I think that sort of, it does, the, the circles sort of, you know, broaden and, um, yeah, eventually we got to the, the sort of, you know, the Rocky Horror kind of fan group. We kind of got smarter about it as we went along. But... We kind of jumped in not really being as prepared as I think you can be, you know, and especially now there's obviously so much, um, you know, everyone, people that have more experience in it, so there's only people that can kind of talk about their experiences and I think that's the best way to, to learn about I it. I think for the one month campaign, it's pretty well, you're full time. Yeah, One or absolutely. two people are full time. You don't yeah. know, but it's, I don't know, someone's trying to donate and they can't. And it's just lots of little things and yeah. you're updating. And yeah, you, you've got no time for your own, like any oh. emails coming in that aren't about the campaign. It's sort of, yeah, it's like being in production. You know, it's just, you kind of have to be in that zone. Mm, it's such an emotional roller coaster ride. But you yeah. said you, you came out of it thinking you'd never want to do it again, but it yeah. sounds like you learnt so much that perhaps oh, and, actually... And also, you know, it sort of... Um, it, it does bring you close to your your audience and, you, and, and your supporters. Like, even now we, we send an occasional update to, you know... We, we send a lot of updates, actually, to the... I think we had... I think we had 350 supporters and so you know if something happens in the world of the film we'll, we'll in the life of the film we'll, we'll send them an email and we've been in cities where we've caught up with someone that donated or met someone at a screening and you know you don't you don't really get that experience on films that are funded in in, in a different way like it does put you kind of very close to your audience, which as a filmmaker is like a really, it's a really beautiful thing. That's kind of what it's about, sort of being able to create those relationships with audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Directly. Do you think if you had, um, if you were going to do it all over yeah. again, if you had three months and, and put your, I mean, as long as you didn't have to hit your target yeah. and, you know, ask, you know, put your target as 100,000 or something, would yeah. you, I mean, now that you know. Yeah. Well... The, the strange thing for us was we kind of almost did hit that 100,000 mm. target over like a three-month period. Um, but I think, do you mean would we reduce it over that period or...? No, if you had to do it over again, if oh. like the next project or if whatever, I, you know, like have a longer, longer period I think and with so. more money because yeah. you have nothing to lose. I think so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's why we were, I was definitely like, oh, well, we've got nothing to lose, let's make it 100,000. That. And you can have that, um, I guess, sort of um, bravery when you're using Indiegogo because you're not, you know, I know friends that have become incredibly stressed out about the possible thing because they're getting close to the end and, and they're not going to hit the target and they end up putting their own money in for the gap so that they still yeah. get the money. But mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Sarah and mm. Aaron. Did you want to start with your clip or did you want to give us a little bit of a rundown first? You've got a shtick 
worked out, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I just wish we'd been here this time last year because it would have been really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're just sort of pulling from all these, um, all of these mm. scenarios. We're going, yep, did that happen? Wish we'd done that. Wish we'd done this. Um, our film's been going on for about four or five years now, hasn't it? So we've I've always found funding quite challenging, and um, so yeah, crowdfunding was always on the horizon for us. Um, but yeah, maybe we we'll show the clip and then we'll, okay. we'll get into a bit more. Yeah. You mentioned funding was a challenge. Yeah, because it's um, we're first-time filmmakers, so we started um, back in two thousand and eleven, um, and. We were using our own resources. We, um, Aaron owns a post house, so we were using uh, your resources there for editing facilities. So we were kind of tracking the story um, with Alec, the father. Uh, and as it developed and grew over time, we realised we had something quite special. Um, but we were struggling to, to find funding and finding a place in, in the marketplace. Uh, so probably about this time last year, so it would have been three years into it, um, we had a big turning point and we um, uh, got through to DAF, we became one of the films of DAF. Um, and that's when we faced a similar decision to you, Pat, was, the, was whether to go for a, um, a DAF uh, crowdfunding route or to go um, possible or something else. So we decided to do both. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it, um, we started with DAF first and we did a mail out and we, we explained some of the things that we were trying to do. We were reasonably successful with that, but we... Um, it, it wasn't quite enough to, to get us going. So we also thought, well, okay, that, that's pretty good. Uh, and it was also at that point that we got into Good Pitch, which was a, that really helped us and that was a, a great platform for us. Uh, but we still had this idea we wanted to do crowdfunding, we wanted to launch um, a possible campaign. We looked at Kickstarter and we looked at Possible. Mm. Uh, but we were still struggling with our timing. We were thinking, when, when should we launch and when should we do this? Um, so we ended up going through the, the Good Pitch campaign, which was wonderful. We, we secured uh, about 200,000 through that process, which was great. Um, but, and then we thought, well, maybe that's a good opportunity to also leverage that exposure and that time um, with, a, with a crowdfunding campaign and tap into uh, an audience that we hadn't already tapped into. So we launched a, a 30,000 possible campaign. Um, and I think we would have secured probably about 70% of that, really. Um, yeah, a lot of money went into and time. As with you guys, we had a, a similar scenario. Um, but yeah, but it was better to have something rather than 100% of nothing. So we thought we saw that as a success and, and it built on our database as well. So yeah, I suppose something, I'm just sort of, some of the things that really worked for us was um, talking very directly to people with our friends and family and really taking the time to explain what we were trying to do. Um, but not with a view to them donating, but what we've discovered is by doing the crowdfunding that they'd chuck in loads of money that you just didn't expect. And that little dinner party that you had where you were just chatting about your film is actually really quite a good way to get some money in. Um, do you want to talk a bit about the, Aaron's more of the sort of technical guy of the two of us. So you were yeah. really tapping into social media, weren't you? Um, yeah, we went through mainly through the social media platform. We chose Facebook to really push it out to our family and friends. Um, by doing that, we, we did a 30-day campaign. Uh, when we first launched, we had a huge explosion. Like A lot of people took a lot of interest to it. Um, we were going for a lot of smaller donations, so we were going for a lot of $10, $10 donations. So through that, we were hoping to get $3,000 um, donations. So when we first launched, we got a lot of interest. Um, we found that around that five, five to six day mark, there was a, you know, a lot of people sort of dropped off and we, we uh, had trouble maintaining, maintaining their interest. So what we chose to do in the last 10 days was um, build a, a graphical countdown. So through the, the network that we developed through our Facebook page, um, uh, from day 10 we basically said this is how much we still need to hit our target. And uh, we made a big, big graphic which our Facebook didn't like because it had too many words on it, and they kept knocking us back. But, um, but with it, we then updated it every day uh, down to the final three days. And at that point, we did a um, a uh, five-hour block, I guess. So every five hours, we were updating them, and and by the end of it, we hit our target, which was yeah. great. So. Mm. Pretty much down to the last five minutes. <laughs> just yeah. great. Wow. And it was one of your, again, it's a contact that had always been in the wings, but it was just like, 
there you go, go on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get you to your target, which was which was great. Yeah. <laughs> so using using Facebook, we boosted um, a lot of those ads. So um, as a lot of people did, we spent money trying to make the money, mm. um, and and we ended up reaching ninety thousand people, uh, and from that we got one hundred and eighty one supporters. So it doesn't yeah. sound like a lot, but um, mm. you know it took it took that many people just to get to the. 181 basically mm. another thing that we were able to leverage i suppose from good pitch was we we had access to a lot of people and a lot of partnerships that we could ask to promote and we sort of had a few celebrity tweets and we which were working really well we had adam goods who was promoting us and um we just saw that massive peak as soon as he went on twitter yeah. it's like the stephen fries i suppose we were sort of yeah, trying to find the stephen amazing. fries for what we were trying to do so yeah. um that that definitely helped us tapping into that resource you should definitely, if you haven't heard of Good Pitch, go to their website and have a look at it because it's been in Australia now. I think this is the second year. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it brings philanthropists together with documentary filmmakers, so it's a really interesting. And what they work on is the impact space after you've made your film about pushing out even further. So so that's definite definitely has been a great thing. Oh, for fantastic. Your project. Absolutely phenomenal. It's just more the partnerships. I mean the money's obviously wonderful, but the partnerships and everything we've been able to do through through that has been amazing. The one thing I'd say probably that we wouldn't do again, just from you know, timing is sort of key to everything, isn't it? And, and where you're putting it out and, and how you're putting it out. But we sort of, what we gained in leverage from putting it out with Good Pitch, we sort of lost in our message because we were successful at Good Pitch and it was kind of like, well, you've got lots of money, why do you need more money? Right. And we were trying to go, oh, yeah, it was great, but you know, we were trying to get to a different audience as well and change the message, but there was definitely that conflict of, Mm -hmm. Do you really need this? And it's hard to try and shift yeah. that, that message. Mm. A lot of that, though, went with like Good Pitch obviously delivers you to the philanthrop philanthropic community, but uh, we had a big backing with the, the community itself, like the Indigenous community wanted to get behind the film. So this gave them a platform to, to contribute. Um, all our friends, family and everything had the opportunity to just drop $10 and, and, uh, and fill a part of the film. Basically. Absolutely. It was a different way to be involved, wasn't it? And there was a definitely a need for it. They wanted it. They wanted to access to the story and yeah. access to what we were doing. So. And no contribution is too humble. I agree. Absolutely. Ten bucks. Yeah. yeah. And that's what, that's what we went for, yeah. Mm. Mm. Any questions for any of the panel? A few years ago I heard um, Thomas Mai from Fan Dependent give some advice that a way to... Because you all talked about this... Mm, not really having a firm concept of how much to ask for and in some cases that matters because you won't get the amount as you've all said. So he, he said that if you um, begin by adding up all your contacts from Facebook and Twitter and your email lists and all of that and divide it by 10 because really only one in 10 people will support you and then multiply it by 50 because that's the average that people give. That, that advice was a few years ago at the beginning of this. My question to you guys that I think would be useful information for people in the audience is do you have a sense of those types of figures now? Like how, how would you come up, how would you advise people to come up with that figure? Is there a formula? By the way, Thomas was one of our, he helped us. And I think Screen Australia funded uh, Thomas at Fan Dependent. It doesn't exist anymore. Yes, they won an innovative distribution grant from Screen Australia in 2011, allowing them to work with 10 Australian filmmakers yeah. over two and years. And we all won, and yeah, I used to call him a life coach of yeah. crowdfunding. He was <laughs> and that like was that. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, I mean, do you think those, those numbers still hold? I was just trying to do the mathematics when you were saying it for the films. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? I remember we because we, we got Thomas's advice as well, and I remember our figure came in higher than I remember Thomas was pushing us to ask for more than a hundred thousand, and I think maybe one fifty, and so we split the diff and went for like a hundred. But um, I mean, from a producing perspective, I was just sort of going, well, this is what we need to raise to, you know, pay Karen the editor for twenty weeks, or you know, get some grading done, or so for me it was like, what do we want to raise in terms of what we need to budget for? Um, but it's, um, yeah, I, I guess maybe looking at other campaigns that are similar to your campaign or similar films that might have a similar audience and seeing what they had raised might be an interesting research, you know. What, what was the average, do you think, of what people were putting in? Oh, around the $25. Yeah. Yeah. So that's already half of what he was suggesting that the yeah. average was 50 mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, Sam, um, when that, that woman who were the, on the Skype, 
I mean, I'd be interested to say, I think US films must attract more than the films here because a lot of those had $300,000. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, two of those were Australian films. Right. Mm. So I'd be curious, it'd be interesting to see the figures yeah. of what's been raised here. It'd be interesting to mm. um, for Australian documentaries because they uh, no, seem to be I around the 30, 50 no. mark, no. unless you, you know, there's a few for 100, but Hidden maybe. Hope. <laughs> I think if I look back, you know, at the DAF um, list, I think our average probably is a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. We got yep. ten thousand dollars. Your average, I would be. Yes. Our average. Is, our average. Is about no, but but it yeah. was interesting because it was kind of like it was the Catholic cemeteries gave us ten thousand dollars. I mean, you know, like that's, you know, and it was just a Jane was talking to a friend of hers who worked for them. And you know, like, and and there's something that twigged in the conversation mm. about um, therapy and death, and it, it was about death, you know, and her mother's death. And she said, "Oh, maybe," and you know, like, and and we pursued it, and we got it. it was mm. Right. But we we also are going to make um, a series of five minute films as well because I'm a problem with. Uh, when the camera stopped rolling in terms of philanthropy, is that it's not about one thing. Mm. It's not about, um, you know, just one thing. It's it's about a lot of things. And the um, the woman who runs the women's network in in Melbourne yeah. said, she, you know, we approached her, I showed her the trailer, blah, blah, blah. And she came back to me and she said, I love the trailer. It's so beautiful, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know how to help you. You know, it's kind of like a really dist- <laughs> soul destroying to say the least. But you know, it's uh, you it's know. It's hard when you don't have that niche group. Niche, that you're not a niche group. Yeah. yeah. So we've got one more clip left, and this is from a um, New York-based collective of visual storytellers. Um, but they're actually a team that met at UTS in Sydney, and that's writer, director, editor Jessica Thompson, and producer Carlo Vallejo, and they have. Carlo has, was associate producer on Back On Board, Greg Laganis, the piece that we looked at right at the top. Um, they've made several short films. One was a finalist at Tropfest NYC. And their successful crowdfunding campaign on Seed and Spark, which is one of the three big American platforms, um, raised $45,000 for their feature narrative debut, The Light of the Moon. Hi, Oz Docs. I'm Jess. Hello, I'm Carlo, and we're the filmmakers at Steadfast Productions. We're actually making our first narrative feature film this year called The Light of the Moon, and we've been invited to tell you a little bit about our experience using Seed and Spark, one of the crowdfunding platforms that you may consider for your independent film. Yep, so we just had a successful month crowdfunding with Seed and Spark. Our goal was to reach 50,000 and we got the green light at 40,000. The great thing about Seed and Spark is that they're just for independent films. So and that's a really amazing thing that they're trying to do and that they are doing. You can actually have a wish list. So from gear to services, from craft services to legal services, you can add all of these items to your wish list and they actually um, contribute to your overall Goal. We're actually very fortunate because another filmmaker who had launched a campaign on Seed and Spark offered to loan us his camera package. Well, another great thing about Seed and Spark is that they actually have their distribution built into their site. So basically, they also offer video on demand. They have a lot of deals with Amazon, with all of these great organizations, so that you can actually screen your film. So obviously, social media is going to be a large part of your campaign. Um, being filmmakers, that isn't our forte. So we hired a social media manager or a marketing manager, um, Lauren, and she was fantastic. You need someone who knows you because they need to have a personal commitment to you and to the project. And you need to also be able to speak to them pretty freely about what your aims are for the social media. We also launched our crowdfunding campaign to coincide with Jess's 30th birthday. So if you can find something in your own, either your personal life or professional life, that will coincide with your campaign, that does, that was our biggest day, definitely um, my 30th birthday. It was a great 30th birthday present. We were also very fortunate that our crowdfunding campaign coincided with Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Hashtag 
S-A-A-M. So we were able to use that in a lot of our posts as well. And that allowed us to, I guess, uh, reach a, a wider audience because uh, we weren't only raising awareness about our film, but we were also raising awareness about this very important and sometimes overlooked cause. So we had an anonymous backer come on board as well who reached out to us. So don't underestimate the power of social media and by putting yourself out there and people will reach out to you and say, you know, I really like your film and I will agree to match donations for that day. Something that we both personally felt very strongly about was having a good pitch video because how can you expect people to give you money to make a film if your pitch video doesn't look very good. We also kept it short. I don't think that pitch video should be very long so ours was only 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Make note of the call to action or the ask, uh, whatever it is that you want people to do within the first 30 seconds um, of the pitch video. Another thing that we should mention about Seed and Spark because they are a small company, that means that they can they, first of all, they curate the site, so you actually have to present your project to them, you have to show them the pitch video, and then they liaise with you and they give you feedback about maybe some re-edits or some changes in your synopsis or things like that. Sydney Spark actually put us in touch with a crowdfunding consultant, and one of the tips that she gave us was, even if people cannot contribute to your campaign, you should really encourage them to share your video or your campaign page to at least one other person. We actually reached out to some media outlets here in New York, but also around the world. The Canberra Times article was another one of our big ones that generated people clicking on the Canberra Times article and they're then going to our Seed and Spark campaign. What's great about Seed and Spark is you can actually see where your traffic is coming from mm. through the website. I think what Jess and I discovered after the month-long campaign is that crowdfunding is a full-time job. The more spreadsheets, the easier your life's going to be, just so that you, you're professional, you're on top of it, um, you're not wasting time looking back through emails, who you emailed and who you didn't. So um, yeah, we really encourage you to be as organized as humanly possible. The main thing you have to remember is that there's an end date for your campaign. We knew what our targets were and when we had to hit them. In saying that, we needed to really understand that it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. If something's not working, talk about it and try something different. A good example of that is our little byline or our log line on Facebook, on mm. Twitter and on Instagram. We change that every week. Yes. So, you know, at first we would, we did the, we're Australian filmmakers. This is, we're making our first narrative feature film here in New York, support our campaign. Then the next one was, we're making a film that affects more than one in five women in the US, Australia and the UK support our film here. Mm -hmm. And eventually we led, we led up to the Sexual Assault Awareness Month and things like that. So, um, you know, change it every week. A lot of our little graphics and things like that, we just came up with at the last minute, you know, we decided to actually make a green light bulb to, to, and to fill it up throughout the month. So when we were at 50%, it was half green. And we also made sure it was an energy efficient <laughs> light bulb so that we could support the environment. So, you know, we posted that we were at 50%, we posted when we were at 80%, and then we posted the wonderful one when it was fully green and we mm. got the green light. Don't just get inundated with the organization and all of that. It is creative and try to think of alternative strategies. We were actually named the interesting incentive of the month by Sid and Spark because for $250 you got a character named after you in the script and in the credits of the film. It's an exciting time to be involved in crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. I know that it's been around for a while now, but uh, especially with some something like Sid and Spark where they focus primarily on independent filmmakers, that gives us hope that you know there is still a, a market for it, um, that people are interested to fund and support films that they want to see or that they want made. And if you want to check us out, we're Jess and Carlo from Steadfast Productions. You can go to our website, S-T-E-D-F-A-S-T -S Productions, steadfastproductions.com, or you can also go to our Seed and Spark campaign, which is seedandspark.com forward slash studio forward slash L-O-T-M for Light of the Moon. Thank you. And that's it. So good luck. Good luck. Bye. Lots of inspiring stuff there. Um, any questions? Let's open it straight up. Yep. Many of you have mentioned about um, reaching out beyond your immediate community to the target audiences, whether it's Indigenous communities or youth or arts or whatever it is. So I'm just interested to have some specific examples um, on how you did that. Was it calling, emailing, you know, did, and what did you ask them to do? Um, and are there any uh, things that didn't work? 
So for um, yeah, so whether you know you ask them to put on their Facebook and they're like, no, I don't want to do it. So just any tips on reaching out to those select audiences? Um, it's hard. I mean, we got we because we get uh, Beyond Empathy was being funded for many years for a camp with young people by the Coca Cola Foundation, for instance, their philanthropic arm. So we tried for a long time to get them to send out a mail out to all their employees, you know, 30,000 of them or something, I don't know. But that didn't happen, but yeah, that's what you're trying to. But as I said before, once you get beyond that first band of your personal friends or business contacts or whatever, as soon as it gets to people who never heard of you before, it just gets weaker and weaker and they're going to less likely to donate. The pyramid gets... Um, less robust <laughs> so but um yeah i mean we had a slightly different story to that though we um we encouraged people uh, again through graphical content on social media to share so pretty much donate and share and then we found that a lot of people were doing that they were sharing immediately through their networks mm. uh, i think that's how we reached like ninety thousand people by the end of it but we ended up raising about seven thousand dollars from random overseas people um who were contributing one two hundred or even five hundred um or we had a five thousand dollar donation from somebody in the United Kingdom. So, um, you know, we, we knew that uh, Indigenous topics were big in Canada, the USA and, uh, and Germany. So we specifically targeted those countries. We specifically targeted men between 18 and 40 um, who, who this story appeals to really. And, um, and we got a result from it, so. I think, you know, everyone's very, they closely guard their networks these days so it's you know you've got to get a good relationship with someone to forward it to all their organization or something mm. Mm. phone calls are always a really yeah a much better way of making personal contact i know we before we even just emailed someone at an organization about possibly sending it out we would call them and ask for the their email and not not give them sort of keep calling until we got an email address that we could then send so we had luck with a bit of that with sort of, yeah, theatre groups and the theatre, the theatre communities in different cities, New York and here in London, yeah. I think it's magic Well, there's, there's, there are two styles of crowdfunding. There's rewards crowdfunding where entrepreneurs pre-sell a product or service to launch a business concept without incurring debt or sacrificing equity shares. And then there's what they call equity crowdfunding. The backer receives shares of a company, usually in its early stages, in exchange for the money pledge. This is the way they've defined it here and the company's success is determined by how successfully it can demonstrate its viability. That's a fairly simplistic um, explanation but that's all I found pertaining to that. So if you put money in a film you become, an, you get equity in it. Like the old yeah. NBA days. Mm. Yeah. You need a really sophisticated legal infrastructure for that. Mm. Yes, yes. You it's would. more thing, it's something and done. And, and you know a whole lot of government bodies would need to mm. get involved I think. It's used more in business yeah. than in film mm -hmm. so far, but we it have is to yeah. Some of our massive profits. <laughs> yes, that's right. How could we do that? I mean, the match funding's getting more like a friend of mine who was doing a photo project earlier this year, and Parramatta Council funded twelve different people. They matched their crowdfunding efforts of these twelve different individuals, so it got various different projects, not just film. So, you know, if Parramatta Council are doing it, lots of people are starting to. <laughs> Hello. Um, how many of you guys pre-sold your DVD? Yeah. In, in 1996, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made a film um, about a group of women who went around Australian motorbikes for breast cancer awareness. And I ran out of money. I was all by myself. I did it all myself and because uh, I couldn't get funding. And uh, what, I, what I did, I ran out of money. And one of the women, women said, I'll buy a DVD. I'll, you know, I'll buy a And then we was like... Let's sell DVDs so all Bingo. around Australia. We sold, a, I, I made about $50,000. Wow. It was fantastic. It kept me going. Helped me, you know, helped me pay Karen Johnson to edit it. <laughs> anyway. Um, we so gave out our DVDs as rewards and downloads and everything. And the people who gave lots and lots of money, I just sent them to Wendy or something, you know, gave three grand or to give for Christmas presents or, because it only cost you a dollar or two. Surprisingly, we didn't. Um, a lot of people didn't take us up on our DVD offer. A lot I of people went for that that higher bracket a little bit. Well, um, we were probably yeah. overpriced. I think you've got to get your pricing right on the yeah. DVD as well. We probably, in retrospect, would have would have come down. We were um, at seventy five, so I think that it was packaged up with other stuff. But mm. I think it should have been lower. Yeah. 
Just the last question, or maybe pretty much just the last one. I'm interested because I know I've, I've supported friends in crowdfunding campaigns or whatever. And to be honest, I'm never giving a shit about the rewards in there. They've come. Yeah, great. I've got a T-shirt. What we do? Yeah. Um, how many of the people you know that really wanted those rewards, and that was like the big deal about why they were funding it? I don't think very many, actually, <laughs> really. I, I think a lot of people like the, the connection and the communication, and they like to see the names on the Facebook site and, and that kind of stuff. They were just part of the community. But really, no one's been chasing for... <laughs> um, I've seen that too, but then I had this big argument on my Facebook group a few weeks ago, whatever, about one guy who reckoned he hadn't got a reward from someone's campaign and how he's sick and tired of funding people because people don't follow up on their deliverables. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. And I think I was like, oh, yeah. so people do care about those things. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think if you do promise a DVD, though, you should deliver on that. I, you know, that's kind of fundamental to your film. But I think maybe the, the fluff around some oh, of the rewards. Someone yeah. else's account. Right. He was whinging about. Right. Mm. At, at our trivia night um, th back in October, some people didn't even collect their raffle prizes because they just didn't care. They just, you know, like it We're was in incredible. The they, zone. Yeah. yeah, and and one of the auction items, either. So. We I've got a friend. In I think when again. our um, <laughs> campaign finished and we'd finished the film and it all finished, we just gave everybody who supported us the two hundred donors, uh, online access, everything. As a we didn't we sort of get finickety about oh you'd given ten and you gave twenty five. We just wanted them all to have a copy of the film. Is it thank you? Mm. I was just going to say we, we offered an experience in the edit suite um, to see the director <laughs> but they don't mind the only was that a joke? <laughs> the only people, the person that took it up was conveniently in the UK so yeah. <laughs> they will make it across well, I don't know whether yeah. you picked up that um, the last couple actually offer people the product placement in the film that if you support it your name is a character mm. so yeah, that's great George Miller did that for Mad Max so did he? oh really? really? Yeah, the he, first he, one? yeah he put, put money into Right. Yeah. Yes. Do they serve? Does all the sort of crowdfunding serve as a pre-marketing campaign then for the screening? When you finally have the premiere, you already have tapped your market and tapped the people coming to see. So that helps later, does it? Yes. Yeah. It's a more, it's just yeah. as important for me. It was that it, as a marketing tool, and to start to build your audience as it was to raise money. You hooked yeah. them. They've invested, so they mm, they want to see the result. And a lot of because a lot of these films and and a lot of these films because they're not funded through the new normal agency or government funding ways, then they're going to rely on you doing a tour. And um, that's when you need all your followers in all the different towns and cities helping you and. So you get more guarantee of doing a tour then. Well, otherwise, how else are you going to get people to see your film? You got to do it to it, unless it's through DVDs. But you still got to get people to know about it to get the DVD. Online streaming, surely, or download. Yeah, but you've got to get them to the eyeballs yeah. to the website or to know about your film. If you're not going to have a tour or anything, how are they going to know about it beyond your loyal supporters? It's also about adding on an experience as well with the tour. So you know, mm. see the Q and A and this this, this walk the red carpet. Yeah. You know. yeah. There's so lots of ways you can sort of give back to those supporters like that to make them feel special. Yeah, so crowdfunding turns out not to just be a platform where people throw that people are throwing money at like a lucky dip. It turns into this other quite interesting way of reaching your audience all the way through. So. And then obviously you're going to use that group of people for your next film, and that'll hopefully um. you're going to build on that. We are running out of time, but there's a question. Just quickly, I'm curious about. Yes, mm. Absolutely. I, I think so because it's so, I mean, the, the time that you spend raising the money and if you've got someone else to do that, it just takes all the worry out, you know, and, and you can direct them um, to some degree, but they, you know, because they're so experienced, they can do it on, a, you know, like really quickly and, mm. and they know how to go about things and, you know, you don't necessarily have, you know, you don't have that knowledge. And how expensive are they? Uh, it varies. It varies. <laughs> it varies. But, you know, like sometimes, it, you know, like we hired one for Love, Marriage in Kabul. 
and um, you know hired over four weeks, but only five days in that four weeks, over four weeks, because you're not doing it every day. You're just doing it a little, you know, an hour here or a few minutes there. So it worked out quite reasonable. It's a time thing. I know someone who's 70 who put the time in to build up his Facebook page for an environmental thing and he got 10,000 people within six months, but he was at it every time. day. Mm. And he sent me personal messages to everybody. And yeah. But there's also other people out there getting really clever because we noticed that this woman put $10 into our campaign because she then that linked her to other things through all the social media and so she was just using it to get more to links friends. for herself. <laughs> no, for her own sort of books yeah. and business and stuff. Mm. So she just did it the minimum amount possible and she was just using it as a sort of spamming thing. <laughs> <laughs> So but there's, was, you know, there's people out there doing all this stuff to mm. benefit them and not you, in a way. That's interesting. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else before we wrap up? I want to say some very big thank yous for tonight. Rowena Potts put an enormous amount of work into this evening with the um, contacting people overseas and reaching out to her networks, and it really wouldn't have worked out without her. So thank you, Rowena. <laughs> We've always got to thank our projectionist. He doesn't always get the thank you, but without him, we wouldn't get the show on the road at all. <laughs> <laughs>